Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, here to explain or to discuss with you the situation in Zimbabwe. I'm also discussing the exploration and development in Zimbabwe. I know Zimbabwe has been in a, it's a hot spot, if you want to say, for probably the wrong reasons, but uh, I think now we have come off edge and uh, can happily uh, discuss and share with you some of the developments that have taken place in Zimbabwe. I know this is a morning conference, but uh, we'll probably delve a little bit into Zimbabwe politics. Please feel free at the end to ask me whatever you want. Zimbabwe is uh, a new democracy or its democracy is evolving, so you can um, ask me whatever you feel like. But the question is, why Zimbabwe? I'll look at the commercial imperatives. Uh, you know, the world is hungry for for, for or it's got diminishing resources and uh, Zimbabwe is one country that comes up as a, a, a very interesting country with a rare concentration of different geological terrains offering a, an extensively diverse uh, mixture of um, uh, 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 minerals. You find all minerals, minerals like gold, rock, rock phosphate, PMGs, diamonds, etc., etc. I will uh, explain a little bit. I'm sorry, um, the, 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 the presentation is not very clear. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. But I will email you on demand whatever I have presented. I will discuss a little bit about diamonds. Apparently, there are a few developments that came in yesterday. Zimbabwe's diamonds or Marangi diamonds have been in the press for uh, a number of reasons human rights violations, uh, sanctions, and all sorts. But I'm pleased to announce that as of yesterday, the Marangi diamonds are now going to be trading internationally, and there are no more restrictions. The uh, World Council of Diamonds has actually lifted all the restrictions that have been earlier imposed on Marangi diamonds. So we will soon see a more transparent way of um, uh, transacting with Marangi. Why were the Marange diamonds um, 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 uh, sanctioned? It was because then when they were discovered, uh, they were discovered by a company called ACR, and ACR went into a little bit of, uh, of course ACR is a, an A-listed company, they went into a bit of a, um, a scuffle with the government. The government realized there were a few anomalies and they seized that opportunity and then um, Almost, they did not, but almost nationalized the diamonds and they were, or they tried to clear everyone out of the diamond field and that brought an uproar. Of course, the um, army or the way the government went about the whole situation was heavy handed and uh, uh, the dispersal of people was also inhuman and there was an outcry about the human uh, rights situations in the Marag area. There then came a few companies that uh, went into joint venture with the government. But um, for some of you who have been following the Marangi controversy, um, Bada came in, a company called Canadel, and then there was also a Chinese company called NGN. But I can simply say the two Bada resources and Marangi resources, Marangi resources took over from Canadel. Canadel, for some reasons, uh, they went into a little bit of debt politics and then the government took over through its ZMDC, Zimbabwe Mining Development Corporation. They took over the Marangi Diamonds. They also are in joint venture with Mbada Diamonds. And um, I know the army is in a joint venture with the Chinese for some reasons I don't know. But of course, I will be able to explain some if you were to ask me. Now, as of yesterday, all that is stopped. Zimbabwe Diamonds are free. And I think it's a very good development for. Uh, the government of national unity because there was a lot of money missing, there was missing funds and uh, there was um, two parallel treasuries running in Zimbabwe and that was a huge problem for the democratic forces in Zimbabwe. Whilst the Ministry of Finance was from the other side, the diamonds were being run by the other party and there was uh, and, and, and a very huge problem trying to account for what was going to the government. But now, um, what the world has just done, it has freed what will benefit for a long time 
the children of Zimbabwe, people of Zimbabwe. Why do I say that? It's because the world can now account for all the diamonds that are going to be sold. The problem that was, there, of course I know the world was trying to fight or trying to push the regime to comply with uh, you know, international human rights, but in so doing, the regime had a few excuses or all the excuses that they could get. They didn't have any supervision. They could sell wherever they wanted and they could keep the money wherever they wanted. But now I believe there is now going to be more transparency. And I actually thank the government of national unity for bringing all this into being. At least the uh, people or children of Zimbabwe will be able to benefit from their natural resources. I'm not going to discuss much about the geology of Zimbabwe, but for some of you who are in the know, the Zimbabwe boasts of, uh, um, of, the, of the Great Dyke, which is uh, one of the most remarkable rock formations in the world. And along the, the Great Dyke, there is a host, or with the Great Dyke comes a host of all minerals. We know uh, Zimbabwe is the largest producer of, uh, of, of, of platinum. That's through um, uh, Zimplas, which is a, a, a subsidiary of Aquarius from South Africa. South Africa, of course, is the world's largest producer of platinum. And the platinum lies uh, along the, or is found all the way um, um, along the, 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 the Great Dyke. Also, Zimbabwe, um, I've just shown here the picture of the Great Dyke. I will not discuss it in detail. But Zimbabwe is also, or oh, hosts, the world largest diamond reserves and the finest, or the world finest diamonds. Now, the other issue is Zimbabwe has got a very good infrastructure. Zimbabwe has been going through some political turmoil since for, from 2000 uh, all the way to uh, 2008 when the protagonists joined hands and formed what we call the unity government. Uh, but despite all that, Zimbabwe has still maintained an infrastructure, one of the best infrastructure or mining infrastructure in Africa. There are very good roads or most assets or most mining assets are easily accessible through good roads. This good railway system, although of course in the past or in the past ten years we've seen a decline in some of the things. They only need to be refurbished here and there. But to be honest, Zimbabwe has the best infrastructure in Africa except South Africa. Uh, Zimbabwe is also Amazingly, the highest literate rate in Africa at 92%. The 92%, that's incredible. It's far much better than uh, Tunisia. Tunisia used to, or Tunisia still stands at, I think, 87%. That's according to UNDP. You can check those statistics. But Zimbabwe boasts of a good labor force. There is good skills, and some skills, even those skills have gone to some other countries. South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Zambia, FSWA, but we still have 92% literate rate. How that has been kept, I'm not very sure, but having worked for the Ministry of Education, we had massive investment in, in, in education from 1980 all the way up to 2000. And that was not affected much <coughs> by the uh, economic downturn that started from 2000 all the way to 2009. And, uh, I can tell you that from that very highly skilled labor force and high literate rates, Zimbabwe has also <coughs> managed to keep itself afloat even through dictatorship. We've maintained and we have steadfastly guarded our judiciary. So if you want to get into Zimbabwe and if you want to do mining into Zimbabwe, that's the, it is the right destination. I know. People are holding on, poor people are holding on, but the time is now. Zimbabwe is also judged by very high standards. I've been living here for quite some time. I'm always in Zimbabwe, though, but I've been living here for quite some time. I've seen Zimbabwe featuring or coming up in our press or in the local press much more times than Scotland, especially uh, during the times from 2000 all the way. Why do I keep on mentioning 2000? Because 2000 we experienced what was called land invasion. 
where people went to confiscate others. We do not subscribe to that. I don't as an individual, but the government did. But some people in government don't subscribe to that. But anyway, that's what happened. So Zimbabwe is judged by very high standards. People are educated or people are learned, and there's a very good infrastructure. The working environment in Zimbabwe is superb. Uh, if I were to advise any one of us in here today, I would ask them to, or well, would advise you all to mm -hmm. take a position in Zimbabwe. Why? Because we know it has got some excellent geology, geology that is comparable to Australia, Canada, South Africa. I would not mind much about the politics because the politics is coming to an end and democracy is taking hold every single day. When I get back to Zimbabwe, I see real democracy taking hold. Um, but I would also advise you to take the first move advantage. Get in there, the assets are cheap. Very, 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 very cheap. And the mining laws are one of the best in, 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 in the world. I know people have got concerns over um, uh, the issue of indigenization. I will probably explain the issue of in indigenization in detail. Indigenization is where Zimbabwe, for those that are not in the know, is where Zimbabwe has politically announced that they want to uh, participate. I have just tried to avoid the issue of nationalization because at no point has Zimbabwe ever thought of nationalizing industry. If they have, then it is just uh, the minority party. The minority party, unfortunately, is the ruling party. But the minority party did mention at some point that they uh, wanted to have this done. But that wasn't nationalization, and the president has also come out speaking about the issues of nationalization, and he has denied that it's no point has his party tried to nationalize. But what Zimbabwe has done, or what Zimbabwe did then in 2008, was that it uh, um, uh, passed a law that requires or says people in Zimbabwe or the indigenous people should be given 51% of businesses that are foreign owned. But those businesses, or the 51% was during that time, even then, was not going to be transferred to anyone free of charge. It was going to be bought. How that was going to be done, um, I really don't know, but I can answer a few questions on how, whether it is possible or not. But then, the 51% has remained aspirational. It still remains aspirational. It's not cast in stone. Yes, I know there's been some rhetoric. Yes, I know there's been a lot of talk about, yes, people, are, there is no nationalization in Zimbabwe whatsoever. But there's been talk. There was election talk. Unfortunately, this year, there was going to be an election around September. And when people were jostling or trying to get themselves to be re-elected, that's where there was a lot of rapid or repeated mention of uh, uh, the 51%. But that is not, that is not at all cast in stone. It's aspirational. Now, there's also been mentioned and talk about companies like New Dawn, companies like um, uh, um, Zimplats having their licenses cancelled and things like that. I, 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 I never believed it for, 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 for once because the minister who is in charge of indigenization is not the same minister who is in charge of mines. So there was a, there was a, there was a conflict between the two ministers. And then there was a subsequent explanation. And we also brought in the minister, we also brought in the government here in London to explain their position. So there's no nationalization whatsoever. Yes, there is indigenization, but people are supposed to discuss. I work for Mayfair Mining. I, I, I have led quite a number of discussions. We've also assisted quite a number of people in trying to, but the issue is that there should be a bit of sharing of the resources or sharing with the locals. And the government has now come up with a, a community share trusts where companies will, or companies like New Dawn or companies like um, ACR were listed, have 
preferred to put in just 10%, and that 10% will be actually paid for by the government or by the community. Nothing is going to be given free of charge. So the indigenization, if you had any worries, please uh, uh, do get in touch with me, or you can get in touch with the government of Zimbabwe. There is no nationalization whatsoever. Now, what I've actually done here is I've just tried to show a little bit of the uh, the gold concentration areas of Zimbabwe, and uh, because I'm under confidentiality, I will not say um, where as may fair we ha we have, but uh, we 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 we're just looking at some of the areas um, around there, and we're going into uh, a joint venture with uh, uh, some Canadian listed companies. We have also um, uh, negotiated and finalised joint ventures with some locals. Again, we have discussed with locals without fear of uh, uh, any nationalization or any indigenization because we know the indigenization law doesn't hold. The indigenization law is very difficult to, 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 to administer. It's, um, uh, if, you, if, you, if some of you who know ESA of India, ESA still has is, uh, is just uh, uh, completed the acquisition of uh, a government-owned company, which is uh, Zimbabwe Iron and Steel Company. And they actually took it for, uh, they took 64%. And we, or the Chamber of Mind then came up and advised the government what they've just done and that the indigenization law doesn't apply because if it does, it should apply equitably and just. And here we are, the government has just given 64%. So indigenization doesn't work. I've also uh, tried to show you in, 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 in pink the areas where uh, my company, Mayfi Mining, is. Uh, 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 looking again, it's quite a number of properties with uh, uh, some some companies. But again, because I'm under confidentiality, I might not be able to say exactly where. But uh, we we feel we are in the right place. We feel we are in the right destination. So we continue. Um, Zimbabwe is littered with gold everywhere, and its gold is in in in, 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 in shares, as you can see. I've also been trying to show you a little bit about Greenstone Belts in Zimbabwe. But what I am doing to you today is asking you to come and to play with us the game in Zimbabwe. There is no fear. There is no need to sit back. There is no more sanctions, if I would say, because as of yesterday, I believe and I honestly think that sanctions have been removed by the um, process that was supported or that had been started by the USA and uh, a process that was also supported by EU, a process that was supported by uh, uh, the United Kingdom. But of course, there remain some targeted sanctions, and these targeted sanctions are on individuals. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed for a very, uh, very interesting presentation. Are there any questions from the floor? Yes, please, give us your name and company. Uh, Ewan Worthington, so Chairman of African Eagle Resources. Um, Mr. Ganya, I've worked in Zimbabwe. Um, my company is now working in Tanzania, Mozambique, and Zambia. We could not possibly go into Zimbabwe under the current rules and current ownership. We'd love to go into Zimbabwe. I think everybody here knows what a geological potential there is. But under the current system, under the current expropriation, if you don't want to call it nationalization, I will call it expropriation, there is no way as a public mining company we could invest in Zimbabwe. And I find it very extraordinary for you to ask us to go there. When, when do you think the rules are going to change? And when is someone going to get rid of the president? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, uh, as I said, I will answer both political and business questions. Uh, when, probably I'll first start by, when are they going to get rid of the president? I, uh, Sadak is working frantically to, um, uh, uh, to satisfy all the um, uh, election requirements of, uh, of, 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 of Sadak. They've actually said, it's no longer in the hands of the President or President Mugabe, as you used to know, but it's now in the hands of the people of Zimbabwe. When is the president going to be removed? I should think if the population does not like Zimbabwe or the Zimbabwean president at all, 
then there will be elections in two years' time, and I think that he will be removed. Well, on a personal opinion, he might not even last that long, and that's very true. And uh, as to the policies, I'm really not sure what policy you are talking about because only last month the Movement for Democratic Change came out with their own empowerment program. So I don't see any policy that is a government policy. The 51-49 percent, as I said, was yes promulgated into law in 2008 as an aspirational law. And that alone has actually been breached. Or if you want, if you want to say yes, there is expropriation, but that was breached by the people that are talking about expropriation. And those people have repeatedly said that they respect the rule of law. And if they do, then they should equitably apply the, and justifiably apply the law. I've never seen anyone whose company was uh, expropriated apart from people who were deprived of their land, not companies now. So I think you need to go back. There is no need to be afraid. There is nothing to be afraid of at all. There is no law that says your company assets will be expropriated or indigenized. But some people suggest that the people who, who may come after Uncle Bob are even worse than Uncle Bob. So why should we risk our capital investing into public? Uncle Bob has no more people that are like Uncle Bob. And if they are, then these people will be, uh, I could spend the whole day explaining to you the political situation and what will avoid anyone coming in and following the footsteps of Uncle Bob. And for your own information, Uncle Bob is himself given himself to, 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 to retire. And what happened in 2008 was also after it had been announced that the, 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 there was no, uh, the, the opposition had uh, uh, gained more votes than they. He actually gave himself to retire. This is inside information, and I can tell you he gave himself to retire. But there are some overzealous people who then reminded him that the Constitution had been changed and you needed two-thirds majority to become the future president, which the other guy had not got. So they then went for a rerun. But this time, I do not see any rerun. I do not see anybody that would stop the winner from taking over. So there are no people that will be taking over from uh, Uncle Bob in a letter like that. If they do, then I can tell you that those people are reformers and those people are currently working with the democratic forces of Zimbabwe because if you were following the WikiLeaks, every single one hardliner has actually been caught giving themselves over to the people. Who know? I might be the president and I'll be very, very democratic. <laughs> Uh, yes, please. Nick Smart from Control Rests. How would you describe the security environment? And by security, I mean to extending to intimidation. Um, how would you explain or describe that at the moment? You mean in Zimbabwe? In Zimbabwe. Okay, fine. Thanks. See, there are some, there are some things that I read in the paper that I personally have not seen. Yes, there used to be some horrible things happening before then, but I think at the minute, the ease so much information with the coming in of uh, uh, the government of national unity and with the swearing in of different ministers from different political parties. Yes, there are a few skirmishes that you would find in, in society, but the actual violence has been eliminated. And this has also forced the president himself, if you want to call him a dictator or Uncle Bob, to explain or to voices concerning against violence. Yes, there are some reminiscence. There are some little pockets that come out, whether they are politically motivated or whatever, but the news that will sell is that they are politically motivated. But Zimbabwe is one of the safest places in Africa. The safest in Africa. Much safer than, uh, well, I don't even know what, uh, Zimbabwe is the safest country in Africa. I've been to the north, I've been to the east, I find Zimbabwe very safe. And I actually find that the best thing that happened to Zimbabwe was the inception of the 
government of national unity and the even further best thing that happened is the continued rise in literacy rates because people are well informed now. If you inform your people, then it is difficult to continue with your dictatorial rule or tendencies. At some point, it will come up. We all look forward to the day that the BBC is allowed back in to uh, transpa uh, transparently report on what, uh, what's happening in Zimbabwe. Are there any other questions or points from the floor? Okay, I think you've said it all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.